By the beginning of July 1944, an important event took place in our battalion. We received new vehicles, a repair flyer, various equipment, and became, like the whole brigade, fully motorized. Almost simultaneously, a replenishment of soldiers and officers arrived. After two weeks of reforming and combat training, we again awaited the order. And it came. Our now already 207th separate motorized engineer battalion of the Order of Bogdan Kamelitsky was to act as a mobile detachment of front barriers in the summer offensive in the LV of direction. And again, the battle. We can only dream of peace. Lieutenant V. N. Morontsev, the commander of the control platoon, commented on the receipt of the order in a conversation with me. The soldiers were impatiently waiting for the beginning of the battle. All intuitively felt this operation will complete the complete liberation of Ukraine from the invaders. And what, comrade captain? Our scout PN. Provorov asked me, how many kilometers are left to the border? So far, more than 200 and much more. Alarmed the sergeant. No, it's nothing. So with our motorization we can get there in a day. We could, if it were not for the enemy. And the German army group Northern Ukraine, which was in front of the front, had a strict order from Hitler not to allow the Soviet troops to advance westward. One warm July night our battalion secretly concentrated in the area of Zaloshtsi, which is north of Tarnopol. Here we waited for further orders, but they did not come. Only at 16 o'clock on July 14th finally began artillery and aviation preparation, but the strike groups of the 60th and 38th armies advanced only a few kilometers so stubborn was the enemy resistance. The waiting began again. On Oprienko, request by radio the situation and tasks. How long can we wait? I couldn't stand it. After a while, Ivan Alexeyevich on Oprienko's head slipped into the staff car camouflaged with masks and branches. So, they told me to wait. They even scolded me, comrade captain. Mysyakov, who had returned from a wound, advised me. Go to the artillerymen, because ours don't know themselves. In the artillery headquarters, which was located nearby in the woods, I really received the necessary data on the situation in the central direction of the offensive front, where our battalion was to operate. So far things are not good, informed me Lieutenant Colonel Artilleryman. There is almost no advancement. So passed the whole day of July 15th. Only on the night of the 16th advanced units of the 3rd Guards Tank Army together with units of the 15th Rifle Corps completed the breakthrough breaking through a narrow strip in the tactical zone of the enemy's defence. The advanced units reached the area north of Zolochev. This narrow strip was called Koltovsky Corridor. The length of the corridor reached 18 kilometres. The width did not exceed 4.6, and in some places was only 2 kilometres. The corridor ran along the only country road between the hills, overgrown with mixed and coniferous forest. On the left and right the enemy attacked, German fascist units were doing everything possible to cut the narrow strip of land along which the endless columns of Soviet troops were moving. Attempts to expand the Koltovsky Corridor did not bring success to our troops, and the loss of time was becoming dangerous, and the command made a bold original decision to introduce the 3rd Guards and 4th Tank Armies through the corridor. Military history has never known a case when two tank armies were introduced in such a narrow breakthrough band while simultaneously repelling powerful counterattacks of the enemy on the flanks. Following the advanced units at noon on July 16th, the battalion's convoy passed into the Koltovsky Corridor. Our 207th Omib was intended to cover the flanks of the Koltovsky Corridor with mines. At any cost, it was necessary to prevent the Nazis to cut the corridor. Vehicles with soldiers and mine detonating means barely squeezed into the flow of moving tanks. From the cockpit of the new headquarters car, I looked apprehensively at the combat vehicles overtaking us. God forbid, they would catch us. At that time, the order came over the radio to turn around for mining in the area of Krugov, Koltov on the right flank of the corridor. With difficulty getting out of the flow of tanks, the companies began mining. At Krugov forest came close to the houses. Darkened. Clouds, illuminated by the moon, 
seemed to cling to the crowns of trees. The battalion had moved a considerable distance from the roots of the troops along the corridor, and we were surrounded by silence. The hum of the engines of the moving columns did not reach us through the dense wall of the forest. A hundred metres from the bridge over the river, on the forest road, near Krugova soldiers found anti-tank mines, and on the paths to the right and left anti-personnel springmenin. So much for birthday mines. What a marvel, comrade captain, it turns out. Senior Lieutenant N.S. Drobnitsa, who had just been appointed company commander, turned to me, not to remove the German mines to immediately put their own. There is no sense I agreed with the company commander. So we decided to leave the German mines. It's not easy for the enemy to find them now. On our side, we covered with mines the other possible exits from the forest to Krugovu. Two other companies, with which was F. V. Maisyakov, mined west of Krugov. The battalion was to guard the minefields, or, more precisely, to defend them when the enemy approached. The soldiers began to dig trenches, preparing for the battle. On July 17th in the morning, fighting in the air began. Soon began heavy shelling of Krugov. Explosions rattled everywhere, shooting was heard. The situation in the mined area became confused to such an extent that it was unclear where our companies were and where the enemy was. Finally, with two units established radio contact, and Company Drobnitsa disappeared, no soldier, no radiogram from the senior lieutenant. Combat was nervous. Centre liaison did not return. The second, the same story. There was no one else to send. The only thing left was a guard at the headquarters car. At least there were some artillerymen friends nearby. We'll have to go. You know the place. Take the horses. Averting his eyes to the side, said Masyakov. A light phaeton, drawn by two grey trotters, ran quickly along the Krugov. The small village, squeezed between the river and the forested hills, seemed deserted. The neat white houses were lifeless. The sun was smiling. Gunfire was heard in the distance. Nothing suspicious caught our eye. But suddenly, afraid of something, the strong horses started galloping. What are you doing? It's just a rally. En Besserub, a stocky soldier from the Don Old Men, murmured from the goat. However, not even a minute passed, as Besserub, turning sharply, shouted in my ear in a voice not his own. The Germans. Strybite. I looked and froze. Ahead, as if from the ground, a wall of people had grown up. They blocked the street. The black barrels of automatic rifles stood out clearly on their grey jackets. The soldiers who stood a little to the side could be distinguished by the tridents stitched on their sleeves. And the horses were bearing right on them. Here is already up to the enemy 200, 150, 100 metres. I don't remember how I jumped out of the phaeton. I felt a pain in my leg. I pressed myself against the house. An unknown force pushed me to run but I forced myself to stay where I was. I couldn't take my eyes off Besserub. Having rushed under the noses of the stunned Germans and Galicinians, he turned the phaeton sharply at full speed and shouted loudly to me. Strabite. The croup of horses flashed by. I jumped, hit hard, but still found myself inside the rushing phaeton. The grey wall of death began to move away quickly. Bullets flew after us. They whistled and buzzed like bumblebees. It was only as I listened to these sounds that I realised fully what deadly danger had been avoided and finally came to my senses. With dazed fingers I pressed the trigger of the automatic rifle. I realised by its twitching that the weapon was in order, hitting the enemy, and I felt at once calmer. Meanwhile there were holes in the phaeton. The left horse was hit, but we passed a steep turn, and Hitlerites remained out of sight. The horses at full gallop carried the phaeton into the forest. Everything happened as in a dream. A day later we found our battalion headquarters, moved after another enemy attack to a new place. Senior Lieutenant Drobnitsa's company, which had suffered significant losses, was also found. Scouts saw that our phaeton crashed into a column of Hitlerites. We were considered dead. That's why when we returned Misyakov couldn't believe his eyes. Out of the claws of death, ha. Huh? He only said instead of greeting, Soldier N. 
Besserab for saving the commander was awarded the medal for combat merits. The whole picture of the operation imagined only those who were in large headquarters, which accumulated information about the operational situation in all parts of the front. We could judge about what was happening only by personal impressions and also by the data of the commanders of the units with whom we had to interact. Sometimes we requested the situation by radio, but received, as a rule, only meagre information about the situation in our area. When a day or two later we received a radio order to move forward along the route with the same task to cover the flank of the corridor, the situation seemed completely confused. Leaving one company at Krugov, we took the route, still clogged with endless columns. The tanks moved parallel to the wheel-broken dirt road. Hundreds of tracks broke two wide ruts, which seemed more reliable than the mud on the country road, on which wheeled vehicles could hardly walk. The muddy mirrors of undried puddles glistened on the route. Occasionally the treacherous summer rain began. After that the ground was even more sour. Our battalion was stopped 10 to 12 kilometres from the neck of the breakthrough. We had barely pushed our vehicles into a narrow clearing to the right of the troops' route when we heard shouts. Tanks. The miners jumped out on the hills and began to place anti-tank mines in the hills, that is just on the ground, hastily masking them with grass and branches. To feed mines from vehicles formed a living conveyor belt. Two kilometres away from us German tanks appeared from the woods and quickly went to our fighters. The tankers opened fire, and the department of Junior Sergeant A. Bilatov continued to shell mines with fuses. When the tanks were already at a distance of about a kilometre, soldiers L. Mudrik and N. Amanov were still spreading mines, covering the approaches to the corridor. Finally, Eptopovsi opened friendly fire. One tank with white crosses went up in smoke. The rest, a little before reaching the mines, turned back. The purple glow of sunset has already painted in brown colour green cars and tanks moving along the corridor. From the hill where we were again mined, we could clearly see the endless stream of Soviet tanks and vehicles being pulled by tractors out of the ravine. Everyone was in a hurry. The position remained unclear. But the indomitable iron stream continued to move westward and it seemed that nothing could stop it. The climax was the fighting near Zolochev. Brodsky grouping of Hitlerites, which numbered eight divisions, tried to escape from encirclement and made a powerful blow to the south, hoping to cut a narrow corridor and connect with the counter-grouping, acting from the area of Zolochev Pluv. Our battalion moving in a column along the corridor was at the tip of the Hitlerite blow. The general, who took command in this area, ordered to urgently set all the mines, including the inviolable reserve. Then by his own order the battalion was subordinated to the commander of the rifle regiment, which took up the defence on the nearest hills. It was July 20th. The first enemy attacks were repulsed. With the dawn of the next day we were subjected to strong artillery treatment. Everything seemed to be mixed up. Hitlerites were in front and behind. In the morning, Captain Dubrovsky appeared. His black as tar eyes were moist, and his lips were trembling. Staff Sergeant Salia was killed by a machine gun burst, such a mineral and a platoon commander. In the middle of the day we clearly saw from the heights we occupied a group of German tanks, which came upon an artillery division camouflaged in the bushes. Our artillerymen were not confused. Several steel boxes burst into flames in the first minutes. The rest fell back to the forest. At that time, from the edge of the forest, huge grey columns of people moved directly at us. Some of them jumped out to our trenches. Hand to hand fighting ensued. Our battalion paramedic, senior lieutenant of medical service PE, Sinovi had to work hard to help the wounded. The next day everything was repeated. But this time armoured personnel carriers with crosses were ahead. They pushed our units. A few vehicles even managed to slip through the corridor. But the gap in the narrow corridor quickly tightened. Then the enemy turned around and again began to advance on the hills, where the defence was occupied by a rifle regiment with our battalion. Do not retreat, shouted the colonel. Ours are close. We must hold out for twenty minutes. And indeed, soon Soviet bombers appeared in the sky. Then along the corridor came thirty Shevakas. 
They without stopping turned around and moved on the Nazis. The enemy trembled. The Germans mixed and rushed back to the forest, but many remained in place, raising their hands. Lieutenant V. N. Moromtsev, the commander of the control platoon, collected a dozen and a half new small size radios with laryngophones. Just for mines. And here is the professor on this part, reported Viktor Nikolaevich, who spoke fluent German, presenting me a round faced fidgety man, Joel. Ich is a radio operator. Hitler is kaput. The German Hopman quickly tuned up the radios and willingly explained how to handle them. The number of prisoners grew rapidly. Only in our battalion they numbered 300 people, and in total more than 17,000 Hitlerites surrendered at that time. The way to Elvolf was finally opened. In front of us was a wide, flat steppe. In some places low wheat was sprouting, in which the machines of the advancing units had laid numerous mixed-up tracks. In the distance we could see the hills stretching along the horizon, which encompassed the ancient city. Having transferred several divisions from the Stanislavski direction, the enemy stubbornly held Elvolf. Our third guards and fourth tank armies failed to occupy it from the start. In front of the Elvolf Hills artillerymen deployed their positions. Fire duel with the enemy did not subside for a minute. Waiting for the liberation of Elvolf, one company and the battalion's staff car were stationed in a dry land over which a small railroad bridge was thrown. Suddenly the clatter of wheels against the rails was heard. A railroad train was approaching the bridge. At the request of the soldier observer it quickly slowed down and stopped. Isn't Elvolf here yet? They shouted at us from the train. And you want to take him on the train? They're so fast. Four men in railroad uniforms went down under the bridge. Today we have to finish rebuilding the track to Elvolf. Echelons are waiting. But the enemy still has Elvolf, I clarified. What should we do? We have an urgent task. We have a mission too. However, the enemy does not consider it. As if to confirm what I said, Hitlerites transferred the fire on the bridge and on the train. Drive the carriage away. Spotted. Angrily shouted the commander. The senior of the railroaders ordered two of his comrades to go back on the train and report the situation. Not the first time the railroaders literally stepped on our heels. It was the same before Elvov. It was not by chance that our interlocutor recalled Napoleon's words, the secret of war lies in the secret of messages. This and the Kraltz know, remarked the commander. They put new mines on the tracks anti-vehicle, so to speak, he summarised. Indeed, on the approach to Elvav, we met for the first time anti-transport mines RME 43. In length, they reached almost 80 centimetres, and thanks to this better intercepted the front direction of movement of vehicles. Because of the low height of the RMI-43 were placed shallowly in the ground, or even not buried at all, reliability of mine triggering in case of wheel or caterpillar collision was provided by five fuses installed in a metal case. A day or two later, Captain Dubrovsky's company had to make passages in the Army I-43 at the entrances to the city, dismantle the rubble of trees and barricades of the defensive encirclement. Almost flew to the dust, Yadrenia route. The captain shared later, so skillfully disguised mines. The devil himself wouldn't have noticed. But petty officer Nikolenko can smell everything better than the devil. Now the roads to the city are open. On July 27, 1944, the troops of the 1st Ukrainian Front completed the liquidation of the encircled group of the enemy and liberated a number of cities, including the regional centres of Elvov and Stanislav. On a clear summer morning our battalion arrived on the outskirts of Lviv from the direction of Korois. We had to widen the narrow passages already punched in the reinforced concrete barriers by the divisional sappers. These were parallelopipes, installed by the Germans in such a way that if the supports were blown up they fell across the road, blocking the passage. The rubble had to be blown up. Soon the battalion convoy descended through the amphitheatre streets to the centre of the city. Washed with light morning rain and ennobled by the rays of the sun, the city looked festive. 
the joyful faces of the citizens flashed by. Old cathedrals with unique contours of bell towers, domes and roofs, houses of original architecture floated by. The greenery of hills and neat squares pleasantly shaded the light and reddish-brown tones of buildings. In the central part of the city, the classical column of Corinthian order, with the figure of Adam Mikiewicz, looking up at the wide-winged angel that hovered over him remained intact. Later we met many monuments to Mikiewicz in Poland. But we have never seen such a beautiful one as in Lviv. And once again we started to walk down the festive crowded streets, where centuries-old buildings left traces of every era. In some places the recent street names were preserved on the houses Adolf Hitler, Kazimierowska, Marzalkowska, Districter. At intersections there were German signs. It reminded that only yesterday Hitlerites were here, that the ancient Ukrainian city had gone through heavy trials. After the Germans captured Lviv on June 30th, 1941, bloody orgies began in the city. Only on the night of July 2nd, 3,000 doctors, engineers and other intellectuals, who had been predetermined for extermination, fell victims of terror. These trials of the Elvivians were conveyed in verse by an unknown poet. Hush, 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 hush. Elviv is covered in blood. It's Christmas. Time for carols. Over Christ the Gestapo. The Gestapo's paws are outstretched. The wrought iron butt of the door is caroling. This beautiful city has been through so much. It faded from the smoke of war but the enemy did not manage to destroy it, and Elviv remained as beautiful, eternally young. The brigade started demining Elviv. As in Kiev, several units were searching for mines. Our battalion was assigned a demining section, which included the objects of the centre and Zeleznodorozhny district. The first impression was that there was nothing for miners to do in a densely populated city, from which, unlike Kiev, the occupants did not evict the inhabitants. At the same time, according to agent intelligence, it became known that the enemy was carrying out preparations to mine a number of objects. In addition, were found short-circuited J. Fedder 504. Therefore, our main task was the detection of time mines at especially important facilities, as well as checking the complex underground facilities and electrical facilities of the city. There was every reason to assume that the Nazis, without touching residential neighbourhoods, could prepare for the explosion of buildings that could be used for the cantonment of military units and hospitals. As soon as the city demining headquarters notified the population about the activities to search for mines, Lviv citizens also came to our battalion to report their suspicions and assumptions. In the first days we managed to find stocks of shells and machine gun ribbons near the ruins of the fortress walls of the high castle. Various ammunition, means of detonation, and some mine surprises were found in one of the stores on Pervomeskaya Street, near the square 80-metre tower of the old Lviv City Hall, in the 300-year-old buildings on Rynek Square and in some other places. One afternoon, an anxious elderly couple appeared at our battalion headquarters. They excitedly reported that they had seen some preparations of a small German unit in the Lachikiv Cemetery. I asked the captain of the Poihata suggested our visitor, a grey-haired man in his sixties, who looked like a grammar school teacher. Lychakovsko Cemetery was not in the battalion's area of operations and, strictly speaking, our voluntary helpers should have been addressed to another headquarters. But did a doctor or a miner have the right to do so? After all, it is not excluded that it was a matter of life and death. Raising the duty platoon, I invited the teacher to accompany us. The car rushed through the streets of Elvov. After passing the openwork brick entrance in the Gothic style, we passed to the old cemetery. Large and small tombstones, crosses, blackened statues, and elaborate crypts were hidden under the crowns of centuries old trees. The site of the cemetery inevitably disposes to reflections, and not only on the frailty of all earthly things. You want to know what kind of people lie under the monuments. You can't help thinking how many interesting things they could tell about the city, about events, about themselves. Maneuvering between the tombstones, we came to a small square in front of the old family tomb. OSD, said our guide. The search began. Me, soon German helmet and flask, as well as hacksaw, 
Axe and scraps of boards were found on the platform and in the crypt, but we did not find any means of blasting or mines. What were the Nazis here for? We can only guess about it, but it is very likely that in the old crypt, until the time someone hid looted valuables, which were then packed in wooden boxes and taken out of Lviv. Our miners had to conduct such searches. The biggest trouble was searching for mines in the building where the office of the Precarpathian military district is now located. According to our data, it could be mined by the enemy. In order to ensure complete safety of the building from the possible explosion of time mines, we had to carry out very labour-intensive measures. First of all, the area along the entire perimeter of the building was thoroughly checked. For this purpose, as in other cases, miners used stethoscopes and VIM-203 mine detectors. But that was not all. Brick-laid openings of basements adapted as bomb shelters were dismantled after all. They could contain charges and delayed action mine closures. The walls were tapped and listened to with stethoscopes to determine the presence of voids or foreign objects and to detect the presence of JFETA 504 clockwork, those modern infernal machines. After inspection of the test pits and a thorough examination of the building, a continuous trench 1.7 metres deep was dug at a distance of one metre from the basement. At the same time, the first and subsequent floors were checked. After the external preliminary inspection, the miners listened and tapped the walls and floors. They examined chimneys and electrical networks. They opened all suspicious places, carefully examined in the attics of water tanks and trusses, probed the backfill of floors. And although the amount of work was considerable, but they gave a guarantee that the time mines would not work. Many of us were concerned about cathedrals and churches. Are they subject to mine inspections? Lviv was famous for its unique monuments of temple architecture. The Dormition Cathedral complex with a majestic square bell tower, the Campion Chapel and the Bernardine Church, the Armenian Cathedral complex. The high doors of the sanctuaries of the cathedral, Assumption and other cathedrals wells were open wide. In some of them there was a service in honour of the liberation of the city by the Red Army. Having consulted with the competent authorities and persons, we came to the conclusion that there was no need to check for mines in the places where the clergy lived. If there were mines there, they were of a completely different order than the miners were interested in. On the second or third day after the liberation of Elvov, we were ordered to urgently check the building of the Elvov Opera House. They were going to hold some mass event in it, and it was necessary to ensure its safety. The beautiful not old building of the opera and ballet theatre named after Ivan Franco with winged figures on the façade was terribly neglected and shabby, but had no serious damage. I and my reconnaissance platoon managed to get into the locked theatre only through the service entrance behind the main façade. After a while came two elderly people who worked in the theatre. We began to question them. One of them, stammering badly, told us that 15 days before the liberation of the city by Soviet troops, a German officer, accompanied by two non-commissioned officers and officials of the Elvov Ukrainian Nationalist Police, came to the theatre. The officers and non-commissioned officers looked around the hall and for some reason lingered on the stage. Were there any works going on in front of you? No, maybe there was no one there. We began to examine the theatre carefully. We examined the understage holds, grates, hatches, mechanisms for lifting the curtain and scenery, electrical wiring. In some cases we used a sapper cat. In one place behind the stage found a section of wall, taped, as it seemed to us, fresh white paper. We should open it, comrade captain, maybe here and installed Fedora, reported his thought scout Provorov. I think that's right, here just ten metres from the presidium table on the stage, supported his subordinate platoon commander intelligence senior lieutenant Alexey Ivanov. Work on opening the suspicious place was carried out with special precautions because each blow could cause the explosion of the alleged charge. And it meant not only the death of miners, but also a significant destruction of one of the beautiful buildings, the pride of Lviv citizens. But soon our scouts were convinced that their fears were in vain. Under the plaster, the masonry was intact. The next day we reported to the command about the safety of using the opera building. 
It took a lot of work to check the building of the Elvive branch of the State Bank. In the basement floor we had to deal with the bricked window openings. The possibility that time mines were located here was not excluded. These assumptions were supported by relatively fresh masonry joints. Control pits were dug, because the most effective explosion and the best camouflage are achieved by placing explosive charges in basements. The big safes of the State Bank huge steel boxes placed against the walls of the basement also caused a lot of trouble. All the safes were locked, and they could not be opened the servants did not have the keys. OS here the Krotz, Cavalier pennies. The miners quipped, or maybe they stole the gold. Keep your pocket wide diamonds. It's probably MZD, and a hundred kilograms of explosives. When it hits, neither money nor gold will be needed, and the whole bank will go up in flames. We were not prepared for such a task as opening safes, and it was dangerous to blow up the locks with an overhead charge if there were explosives inside, they could detonate. We had to contact the local authorities. The next day they sent us a foreman who quickly found the keys to the first safe. In case there was a surprise that could be triggered by opening the safe door, a cable was attached to the handle of the safe, everyone was taken out of the room, and a soldier who was in hiding pulled the cable. There was no explosion and the safe was empty. All the other safes were opened in the same way quite quickly. But both the miners and representatives of the state bank, who were present at the opening of the safes, were convinced that there was neither money nor gold there. Almost all the safes were empty, except for some unnecessary accounts and a few new office books which we found. Dot 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 much attention was paid in Elvav to the search for electric fuses. There were reasons for that a number of objects in the city were found to have a significant number of electric detonators. To destroy the city buildings, where headquarters, military units, hospitals, warehouses could be located, the enemy was able to use electric fuses, exploding them at a distance through the electrical network. The 34th separate battalion of electric barrages and the 211th company of special mines of our brigade were checking the power grids. Other units of the brigade in their demining areas were also searching for electric fuses. In this connection, the chief of staff of the electric fence battalion, SP, Beryl, came to us. Allocate for a couple of days your auto-electric power station, he asked. We have a lot of work to do. Captain Beryl was short in stature and stocky. A sad smile occasionally flashed in his intelligent, lively eyes. Taking off his cap and stroking his shaved head, Beryl spoke fervently. Understand this. We have disconnected the objects suspected of being mined from the city power grid. The battalion does not have time to cope with its tasks. How can you compare the amount of work? We had to disconnect all the substations and central distribution points of the city's power grid. Now we're checking them out. And you. Mysiakov and I gave in and allocated a car power plant, NPP3. Brigade electricians had to thoroughly check the power grids. During the search for extraneous connections from the network was removed from the load and called it with megometers. Then 110 to 120 volts were given to the localized networks, and of course all persons from the inspected building or object were removed. Objects were considered to be tested only after a trial power supply. Checking the underground urban economy of the city was also a very labour-intensive affair. After all, large explosive charges could be laid in collectors, water supply and sewerage networks near important facilities and intersections of the main streets of the city. As assistance during this period, our units attracted mine detecting dogs from the 70th Battalion. Among other sites, our battalion carefully checked the stone barracks buildings located on one of the steep hills and labelled as a citadel on our plans. We were told that in this area, on the night of July 4th, 1941, Ukrainian nationalists from the Nachtigal Battalion, which operated as part of the SS troops, had shot the famous writer and Professor Tadeusz Boy Zelensky, medical professors Adam Solovy, Anatoly Cezizinsky, and other local intellectuals. In the buildings of the citadel we found explosive charges prepared for installation. They were tied with twine. Several charges were in canvas bags. All the charges had holes for setting detonators. There are more trophies, comrade captain. 
reported the platoon commander and Ivanov, and showed the ready incendiary tubes, which remained only to insert into the charges of explosives and pull the cord the Rochnogo igniter. In the basement of the bastion building on the wooden, thoroughly rotten floorboards stood massive metal boxes. These contained electric detonators stacked in small galvanized iron boxes. Other crates were filled with coils of flame conductor cord connecting tubes and teeter totter igniters. We discovered niches prepared by enemy sappers for laying explosives. While the miners of our 42nd separate motorized engineering brigade provided Lviv citizens with safety from explosions of infernal machines, mine surprises, and electric fugazes, the life of the big city was getting into a normal rut. Plants and factories began to work. Trade was rapidly expanding. The streets became lively and noisy. Only air raid sirens still disturbed the townspeople at night German fascist airplanes tried to bomb ancient Lviv. A week after the liberation of the city, we were invited to the district executive committee for a regular meeting of the district demining headquarters. When we entered the office of the chairman of the Zeleznodorozhny District Executive Committee, he already had a visitor. The man we saw looked like a resurrected dead man. The waxy skin tightly encased his facial bones. This man must have once been handsome, but his face had become a mask. Only the large black eyes were full of life. Behind his chair stood an elderly woman, apparently his wife, whose face expressed tenderness and sadness. It was hard to look at this unhappy man, but it was also impossible to tear one's eyes away. It was as if everyone was waiting for something, but there was no conversation. Finally, the chairman came out from behind the table. The wrinkles on his face trembled. Here is the decision of the executive committee, he addressed the stranger. You are given a room with furnishings. Get well. The visitor tried to stand up. Some sound escaped from his mouth. Don't worry, the chairman reassured him. The black days are over. You need to heal. We will help you. An employee of the district executive committee together with an elderly woman led the unusual visitor out. The day before yesterday, the miners found this man in a sewer, said the chairman of the district executive committee. He had spent three years underground. His wife used to give him food at night. There was silence. Everyone was thinking. I thought about the fate of the man I had just seen. He must have escaped. There must have been a chase with dogs that I could imagine. But a life in a sewer well where you had to breathe sewage. My imagination refused to paint all the details of that three-year imprisonment. And the martyr's wife, that pleasant, aging woman. What measure to measure her modest and imperceptible feet? Every night when patrols were rampant, she lifted the lid of the right well, and handed her husband a piece of bread. The woman was risking two lives at once her own and his. She must have realised that everything depended on her, and that was empowering. And so it went on for a thousand nights. With the next mail, delivered to us in Elviov, came an official notice from the head of the hospital about the death of Captain S. A. Barabashov. A. Barabashov from Krupy pneumonia. It can't be some mistake. There are people whose death is hard to believe. Sergei Barabashov was from Odessa. He happily combined the soft humour of a southerner and amazing concentration, sometimes taken even for sullenness. He had a large, strong-willed face and deep-sitting brown radiant eyes, immediately disposing to himself. He loved people, always strived to be closer to them, and achieved the transfer from the political department of the compound to us in the battalion when the fighting was still on the left bank of the Dnieper. You and I, Chief of Staff, we need to help the battalion commander, said Barabashov soon after he was appointed Deputy Commander for Political Affairs. Help. Yes, of course, he is a brave man, but he obviously lacks knowledge and erudition. With Barabashov's easy hand, when the situation allowed, we began to have debates on various topics. We discussed Ehrenberg's and Simonov's correspondence, military events, the position of the Allies. We recalled episodes from the novel War and Peace. We argued a lot about life and death as philosophical categories, about what happiness is. The one who thinks that at the front they talked only about war, about fleeting hobbies, about a shot of vodka and repairing boots. 
is mistaken. The interests of the frontline soldiers were wide and multifaceted. More than once I witnessed long heated debates during which the soldiers tried to understand the meaning of human existence, the essence of politics of different states, to understand the causes of wars. And there is nothing surprising in all this. Encounters with death make people think about many things. Once the conversation was about the impact of war on man, it was a question that worried many people. Are we becoming rude? Are we becoming callous, insensitive? After all, in war, directly or indirectly, a soldier has to kill. Well, we're not pacifists. It's all about the purpose for which the war is fought. We're fighting a just war of liberation. This is what forms the moral attitude of people, said Sergei Barabashov quietly. And after a pause, he continued, Yes, we are killed and we kill. It may sound paradoxical, but in the fire of battles we become thinner, or something more attentive, more soulful. All small things recede, and thoughts become purer, loftier. As Sergei Barabashov has rightly said, Sometimes the deputy head of the political department of the brigade G. E. Krivitz came to visit us. At that time, the range of discussed issues was even wider. I want to know, why do you think Prussian military ideology is so persistent? Captain Krivitz began. Barabashov, who knew perfectly the works of the classics of Marxism, Leninism and military history, was usually the first to join the conversation. The conversation began, in which Clausewitz Hegel, Multi E. Schlieffen and Ludendorff were mentioned. Again, the scholarly talk started. Grumbled in the first few days. Then the grumbling stopped. He began to listen with interest to our discussions. And some time later was not averse to talking to the commanders of companies and platoons to meaningfully report recently learned new information. We and the deputy commander more than once witnessed how flaunted his erudition combat, and Sergei never missed a chance to jokingly stab me in the side, say, see. The fruits of enlightenment. Several times Barabashov told how Hitlerites, trying to demine our minefields, drove cattle on them. Having figured out the enemy's trick, our units began to open fire in such cases. Then the fascists forcibly drove local residents, women, children, old people to the mines. You see, a lot of time has passed, but still, I can't bring myself to forget this horrible picture, Sergei admitted with pain. When we found ourselves in the breakthrough strip of enemy tanks on the Kiev bridgehead, he confided in me. I'm afraid of only one thing to be captured. I'd rather die. And when once the commander of a neighbouring unit rudely reprimanded his subordinate, Barabashov could not stand it and said, You do not believe in people, comrade lieutenant colonel, you don't want your words to reach the heart of your subordinate, to touch his best strings. It's all philosophy, Captain. Do you know that in Greek philo means love, and Sophia means wisdom? How can we live without them? Before the war, Captain, you must have taught these philo and Sophia. You judge everything very cheerfully. A man who has often risked his life knows as much about it as a philosophy teacher, that was the end of their peak. Yes, the communist Sergei Barabashov knew people and knew how to find the keys to their hearts. He had a lot in common with Volodya Nazarov, sincerity, simplicity, convincing logic, and most importantly, love for people. On one of the warm August nights, when the air raid sirens wailed, a panting contact came running. An urgent package, comrade captain, the duty officer sent for you. The battalion was ordered to arrive by morning in Peremyshal to demine the city and to equip mine barriers on the city's defensive rim. One company of the battalion was ordered to be left to continue the search for mines in Elvov. We went on the alert at night. The blue velvet sky was crisscrossed by the beams of searchlights. The bursts of anti-aircraft gun shells sparkled like stars. From Elvov to Peremyshal only 120 kilometres, and by morning our column, arrived on the eastern outskirts of the city. Wooden barracks, barracks or former concentration camp were completely broken. But when we drove along the hastily cleared road into the centre of the city, we saw preserved stone buildings, tiled streets and old overgrown trees, almost untouched by the war. 
The grey-white waves of the wide and turbulent Sana are cut off the western flat part of the city. The old border arch bridge over the Sambal River was captured intact by General Rabolko's tankers. The eastern part of the city rose sharply uphill from the bridge. Steeply ascending streets with good stone houses winding and looping led to the old fortress on the mountain. We were accommodated in a modern mansion on a green street below the fortress. More than once we were approached by residents of Peramishal, asking what we could do for them. They understood that we were interested in the MZD and pointed out many places suspected of being mined. The battalion immediately began checking the main sites for mines. One of them was an old fortress with stone casemates and earthen ramparts. The fortress dominated the surrounding terrain. From the height on which it was located, well viewed all around. The valley of the San River and the forests on its left bank were especially far away. In the damp, shallow casemates of the fortress we found German helmets, cartridges and boxes of anti-aircraft shells. Standard kilogram charges of explosives in metal shells were also found. But the real surprise for us was the discovery in the basement of one of the casemates of rusty Russian three rifles and three-edged bayonets. That's when I remembered my academic history lectures. In the First World War here were battles of the 3rd and 8th armies of Generals Ruski and Brusilov with Austro-Hungarian troops. It was in these places that the now legendary General D. M. Karbyshev, a division engineer of the 78th and 69th Infantry Divisions, fought in those years. During the period of engineering support of the attack, Dmitry Mikhailovich was wounded in the leg. And in May 1915, already being a corps engineer, he participated in the defence works in the area of the same fortress. In the Galician operation of 1915, the fortress of Peramishal was one of the strongholds of the defensive line, which passed through Nov Masto, Sandomir, Peramishal Sambor. And the old Russian weapons we found involuntarily reminded us of former battles. Fortresses are the anchors of the state once wrote the famous fortifier N.I. Kokhanov, and it was true at the time. But now, many years later, the small fortress of Peramishal, with its earthen forts and ramparts, stone and concrete casemates, has lost its military significance. It has become, as some fortifiers put it, just a basket for shells of modern artillery. Having blown up the found shells and cartridges of the enemy, the miners left the old fortress, which served our courageous compatriots well many years ago. Another object of mine searches were buildings in the left bank, plain part of the city, which during the occupation housed Hitler's military units. In two-storey and three-storey modern houses, all the rooms were filled with cartridge tapes, machine guns, Faust patrons. In nearby one-storey warehouses and garages we found piles of military equipment and stacks of ammunition. Near one of the buildings there were several defective cars which the Germans had not been able to steal. A large amount of explosives concentrated near the bridge, in the fortress, in the transit camp and in the barracks testified to the enemy's intention to prepare a number of objects for explosion. Only the suddenness of capture of the city and fortress Peramishal by tanks of General Rybolko did not allow Hitlerites to realise their plan. Many inhabitants of Peramishal addressed to the battalion headquarters, offering their services and help to the miners. Among them were engineers and agronomists, housewives and artists of Ukrainian operetta, stuck in the city during the German occupation. Everyone was eager to help in some way. One of the first to come to us was a thin and fragile-looking blonde girl. She spoke fluent Russian, though sometimes a pleasant Polish accent slipped into her speech. I heard that the Panovs are demining the city. I'd like to offer my services. I feel it's my duty. But, uh... There's hardly any suitable work for you. Suitable? He must think I'm averse to dirty work. I can assure you he's mistaken. You can't, for example, dig the earth. It's hard, and you're so. Is he saying that I'm weak? Maybe. But still, I'm willing to do that too. What do you know how to do? Pan wants to know my profession. I'm a linguist. I write Russian, Polish, German. That's good. We need to write a lot of announcements for the citizens and signs demand. Agreed? Of course. 
Thank you, sir, Mrs. Helena started right away. We gave her two more assistants and the work began. The next day the girl said that her father, an icon painter, having learned about our needs, offered to make stencils for signs checked, no mines detected and to do other work that we needed. Father is waiting for him in the workshop. He'll show you a sample. I had no free time and I didn't want to go to the workshop of what seemed to me to be a third-rate godmaker. He probably even gods on the stencil rights with annoyance, I thought, and directed to the artist platoon commander Lieutenant V. N. Moromtsev, who is a platoon. N. Moromtsev, who before the war worked as an architect in Kharkov, knew a lot about painting and drew watercolours quite well. Comrade Captain, you must visit the workshop. There are real masterpieces there, Moromtsev reported, choking with delight. Together with the lieutenant we went to the artist. A small two-storey mansion, at which we stopped, was located in the western part of the city and overlooked the San River. We went upstairs to the studio, which was full of framed and framed paintings and canvases. The first thing that struck me was a portrait of a girl in a blue dress with a tasseled cape over her golden hair. It depicted Mrs. Helena. The picture, painted in the style of Kramskoy, was so good that I could not tear myself away from it. Are you a little excited, Mr. Captain? Hiding a smile in his grey beard, the master of the house asked. He had been watching us all the time, either out of curiosity or out of a professional habit of studying nature. You are an excellent painter, and I don't feel comfortable entrusting you with any stencils I confessed frankly. It is inconvenient for me to stay away from the holy cause there is a war. The artist handed over the already finished stencils for our inscriptions and a heavy sack. I asked the captain to accept this. Here are the colours burnt bone, cadmium, brushes for filling the stencils. What about you? Paints are scarce these days, needless to say. People are losing their lives. You've seen the camp by the road, of course. Yes, we saw the Peramichal transit camp. We saw the rows of barbed wire, the electric insulators on the poles, and well imagined the fate of those who once passed through the wire tightened gates. Almost a year had passed. We were already far beyond the borders of our homeland. Voronezh, Kiev, Berdichev, Brody, Elvav, Peramichal, Krakow, which we had demined, were left behind. And not only them, hundreds of settlements in Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Germany were also demined. With the most difficult conditions of mine clearance we faced in February, March 1943 in Voronezh, through the city past the front edge of the defence, the enemy densely mined streets, squares. In residential and public buildings, Hitlerites used mine surprises on a large scale. All inhabitants, Hitlerites, evicted from Voronezh, and there was no one to get information about the actions of the enemy. It was Voronezh, where the safety of citizens was paid by the blood of many miners, was for our brigade the first and the most severe school of demining of cities and settlements. Later, while working in other settlements, losses of miners became an exceptional phenomenon. This was explained primarily by the fact that there was already accumulated a lot of practical experience and thorough advance preparation for demining. And it all started like this. During the formation of our engineering brigade on the Don in 1942, Vitaly Petrovich Krasnov, who was at that time a lieutenant colonel, gathered at his commanders. Who of you, brothers sappers, put mines and clear mines? asked the commander. It turned out no one. Having found this out, Krasnov even turned pale. How will we fight? he asked brokenly. Do you know that engineers more than others are subject to fear or danger? and the brig made a stirring speech about the importance of engineers in past and modern wars. He had a remarkable memory, and quoted much by heart from Peter the Great's Statute of Military 1716. Then our commanders heard that. Engineers are much needed when attacking or defending any place, and it is necessary to have such, which not only fortification thoroughly understood, and in that already served, but that they were also courageous because this rank is more fearful than others. After a pause, Vitaly Petrovich concluded. Well enough of talking. 
we must prepare the miners as soon as possible. The first lesson tomorrow will be held by engineer Captain Katurkin. Remember, it's not easy to set a mine, but it's a thousand times harder to disarm it. Two and a half years have passed since then. A lot has changed during this time in the 42nd separate motorized engineering Elvov Brigade of the Order of Red Star. Colonel Krasnov was no longer with us, some officers were replaced, many soldiers and sergeants left. In the battalions appeared first-class mine clearance specialists. They have accumulated precious grains of personal practical experience, which is difficult, and sometimes impossible to pass on neither in instructions, nor in the instructions. These miners and entered together with the troops on the streets of villages and settlements of Priden, in Voronezh and Kiev, in the Polish cities of Krakow and Roklaw, in the Czech city of Trutnov, in the German cities of Gorlitz and Dresden. On the defensive lines of almost all cities and large settlements the brigade units had to demine the outskirts or make passages in the German mine barriers for the passage of troops and to ensure the vital activity of settlements. The mining of streets was carried out in many cities. But we encountered serious difficulties in Voronezh and Berdichev. The streets of Brody were thoroughly mined by the enemy. Even more troublesome to our specialists were mine surprises of tension and pressure action. In dozens of settlements of Voronezh, Kiev and other regions, in Elvov Peremyshal Krakow, Trutnov Gorlitz, many hundreds of these devil traps were neutralised. Thanks to the efforts of our miners, only the demining of surprises helped to save the lives of many thousands of inhabitants of cities and small towns, not only in our country, but also in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Germany. And still the most difficult business for us was the search of time mines. Hitlerites had quite a big experience of application of so-called infernal machines. As trophies we got several dozens of secret German closures for MZD clock J Fedder 504, designed to slow down in 21 days, and electrochemical, designed to act for 32 days. When we searched for time mines in different countries, a lot of help came from the local population. Although we spoke different languages, the sappers perfectly understood those who sought to help us. On September 7, 1944, we stopped at the Polish village of Wojtzorka, north of Krosno. Here, on a narrow oblong hill, we had to urgently set up an observation post. The foothills of the Carpathian Mountains were clearly visible from the height dominating the immediate area. The undulating outlines of the mountain ranges covered with dark green brush of the forest were clearly visible and behind them pale purple mountain distances deepened the perspective of the landscape open before us. Already at dawn of the next day at the front line NP near Vichovka began to arrive Vilis. The first to arrive was the commander of the 38th Army, K.S. Moskalenko, accompanied by a group of generals, and soon came the commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, S. Konev. Artillery and aviation preparation rumbled, for more than two hours the wide valley and foothills of the Carpathians were methodically ploughed by shells and air bombs. This majestic and terrible picture was clearly visible from the NP. Then our troops went on the offensive. Carpathian Duklinskaya operation began. We of course did not know the plan of military operations, but we guessed that the urgent regrouping of troops and the transfer of our battalion to the 38th Army were associated with the Slovak people's uprising. A shock group of front troops was being created to help the rebels. Part of the forces of the 38th Army and attached tank, cavalry and Czechoslovak corps began the offensive from the area of the Polish town of Krosno. All of us were eager to help the Slovak insurgents as soon as possible. That is why the haste with which the strike group of the front troops was formed near Krosno did not bypass our small unit. Before receiving the order to arrive at Vishyavka, the battalion operated as part of the front mobile barrier unit. We covered the tank hazardous directions on the very stretched left flank of the 38th Army in the area of Sanka, Jurowiec, Trepcha. There the flanks of the first and newly created fourth Ukrainian fronts converged. In most areas there was almost no infantry, and the flank defence was carried out by artillerymen alone. West of Sanka, the battalion set minefields in the defiles between the forest and deep ravines. But September nights with thick darkness allowed German scout sappers to secretly remove several mines. Then we used the electric fence company attached to the battalion. 
we deployed P5 nets in the defile in front of the mines. The cable from the nets of the AE2 defeat station was connected to the generator. Gave current. The next morning we found out that one German mine surveyor and two inconsiderate hares, who had jumped out, obviously from the field that had not been cleaned yet, were still lying on the nets. It was not possible to hand over to the artillerymen the minefields that had been set up. To remove the mines in such a situation meant to open the gates to the enemy. We had to leave west of Sanka Company RV Dubrovsky and another platoon. The battalion entered the fights at Krosno in incomplete composition. As soon as the cannonade was silent, the commander showed me a sign on the amphibian, and we moved behind the companies that had gone forward, which cleared the routes of the 101st Rifle Corps. The amphibious vehicle shook along the route broken by explosions and tank tracks. Here and there flashed signs mines. We moved in a rut in a rut. Barely the battalion came to the road snaking between high hills, the enemy began heavy shelling. Traffic jams formed on the road. Flank fire from the Carpathian foothills crossed with fire from the Krosno area. This meant that it was not yet possible to take Krosno and the main road was still cut by the enemy. Only after three days our troops broke into Krosno. The situation improved. Fresh units arrived. Among them were units of the Czechoslovak Army Corps. It was nice to feel the elbow of the people whose state border we were to cross in the next few days. Volunteer interpreters were quickly found. With their help we had quite a successful conversation with Czechoslovak soldiers. The conversation was about the upcoming battles. The Carpathian Mountains stood on our way, and we of course thought about how to overcome this natural fortress more easily. The new dapper, as it seemed to us, uniforms of our friends testified to the fact that most of them were new recruits. Some of the officers drove around in tiny imported small cars, completely unsuitable for frontline conditions. The Czechoslovaks also had willies. When we were stationed in a small village under a mountain north of Teodorovka, there was a unit of the Czechoslovak Corp next to us. One overcast day the enemy launched a heavy artillery attack on the nearby heights. Our village also suffered. German tanks attacked the heights. Our Czech friends withdrew, so we flinched. The artillery captain justified himself later. And now? Now we're in order. The Czechs with our support recaptured the height. Lieutenant Sohor's battalion was operating there, explained a Czechoslovak officer, to whom a military officer from the artillery division was bandaging his wounded arm. It will be healed before the wedding, said the military officer affectionately. Soon we'll be drinking Pilsner beer in Prague. Of course we will, the wounded lieutenant smiled at us. Our beer is good. However, the hostilities in the Carpathians delayed the fulfilment of this modest wish for eight months. The time dragged on painfully. For a few days the troops advanced only 10 to 15 kilometers, and the rebellious Slovaks could not wait long. The command made a decision to enter the First Guards Cavalry Corps into the narrow gap in the German defense, which was to make its way to the rebels. Our battalion was sent together with the cavalrymen to the breakthrough. We received an order to be at the disposal of General V. K. Baranov by the end of the day, and with whom only had to act. With infantry, with artillery, with tanks, but with cavalry for the first time. That's where our Dorofeev will take his soul. Grinned Commander. Mixed forest in the mountains of the eastern Beskids was already painted in some places with an autumn gilding. Warm, slightly moist forest air was clean and clear. It was easy to breathe. There was water on the roads after the recent rains. The soldiers were pushing their vehicles, which were slipping on the ascents, and shells, tearing along the track, drove up the troublesome sappers. On such paths you can't use cars. Here we need Dorofeev's horses, Masyakov said anxiously. Captain E. I. Dorofeev, the assistant of the commander on the economic part, was known among us as a great lover of horses. We have become motorized, repeatedly proved to him Maisyakov, and you, thank God, have two dozen Sivoks. They are quite enough for the needs of the battalion. What are you dissatisfied with, Captain? 
Why do we need so many vehicles? We're running out of fuel. Lubricants. And I'll always feed the horses, Dorafeve wailed in reply. Unnoticeably for himself, he was fond of memories. It was like that in the Civil War. I was a pupil in a squadron then. To the horses. A. Hey, Efim Ivanovich, what am I going to do with you? Many cavalrymen, for example, Commander Rybolko and Lelyshenko, have been on tanks for a long time. And you're yours, tried to convince Dorofeev Mysyakov. So I'm from the reserve. And in this connection, comrade combat, allow me to take two more horses. German. Trophy horses. We need to replace ours. Quick has started to fall on his left front. And Red's withers won't heal. No more horses. The commander flared up. Understand, comrade captain. Or your withers will not be happy. Major F.V. Mysyakov knew and loved horses well. As a child in the village of Durasovka, Penza region, he went to the night. He had to take care of horses and work on them. But Fyodor Vasilyevich felt the pulse of time and, of course, understood the importance of motorization of our battalion. At the same time, the horse problem at that time was still acute for us. A horse and wagon could drive up where a heavy truck would not pass. It was easy to camouflage the horses near the front line and thus to bring mines for installation or to take them away from the demine field. We must admit that in 1944 horses played a significant role in the life of the battalion. Especially they came in handy during a raid with cavalrymen through the enemy rear. Where did our Budenovitz disappear to? Looking at his watch, anxiously asked the commander. There was really very little time left, waiting for Dubrovsky's company, and a platoon from the second company, also delayed in the minefields, was not possible. It was necessary to hurry to catch the First Guard's cavalry corps in the appointed place. Otherwise go and look for the corps in the mountains. On narrow, winding roads we reached the appointed point. It got dark. In the headquarters of the compound, which we found not without difficulty, there was only the head of the rear of the corps, stocky, grey-haired Colonel Tikhonenkov. He was sitting in the hunting hall of a small manor house, and the shadows from the horns hanging on the walls moved ominously at the slightest fluctuation of the flame of the smoker. You are late, said the colonel grudgingly. There is data that the Germans have found the place where the corps entered the breakthrough. We should hurry up. The battalion was preparing to cross the front line. The units were concentrated on the precipitous mountainside, to which slender pine trees clung timidly, as if afraid to break down. Company kitchens visibly lifted the spirits of the tired soldiers. The silence was broken only by the characteristic sounds of spoons touching cauldrons and soldiers' witticisms about the convenience of combining lunch with dinner. It was the third hour of the night. Officers were checking weapons, mines, soldiers' equipment. They were to go light steam wagons with mines, explosives and tools had already been prepared. Explosive means and mine detonators in pouches were distributed to miners it was considered dangerous to concentrate them in one place there was no knowing what could happen. Companies moved along the ravine. At the agreed place we were met by the commander of the cavalry squadron. Ahead, across the road, a path uphill with a smile of some superiority of a cavalryman over the infantry warned him. The wagons will pass. On the right and left our tanks cover the neck from Lisagora and Glois. Sabolniki, artillery on horseback, and the corp headquarters passed. But the convoy got to the... Bending down, we got out to the road ditch, but it was beginning to get light. The enemy detected the movement and opened fire. A messenger cavalryman said that the commissary insisted on returning. We had to leave. However, everyone understood by evening we would have to return again. In the afternoon, the enemy bombarded us with fire. It seemed that we were in hell. We had to literally dig into the ground. When it began to get dark, came and the company of Captain A. V. Dubrovsky. V. Dubrovsky. As soon as darkness densely enveloped the ground, the battalion again made the familiar transition to a deep ditch of the highway. This time the main forces of the unit quietly crossed the front line and along the path leading uphill one or two kilometres deep into the rear of the enemy. At first it was quiet all around. 
But then somewhere behind us the night silence was broken by machine gun fire. Soon reported that the Nazis attacked the battalion's horse cart. The platoon, covering the cart, lost several men. Machine gun bursts served, apparently as a signal for a strong artillery cannonade. But the fire was already behind us and subsided by the minute as we moved away from the front line. The fighters were tired and kept on their feet only due to the huge nervous tension. And there was a new surprise we came to a forest road which was not marked on the map. Where to go next? The scouting officer, Lieutenant Provorov, was the first to notice a large glowing arrow with the letter B at the end. With this letter begins the last name of the Corps Pombanda. We should go this way, he said confidently. The arrow turned out to be made of forest rotted wood, the phosphorescent glow of which was unusually bright and beautiful. Having laid out the letter M near the letter B, we moved on, orienting ourselves by the same luminous signs. In the early morning of September 14th, 1944, the forest road led us to a narrow valley of a mountain stream. A heavy silence fell on our shoulders. Only the pebbles rustled treacherously under our feet. Ahead of us, on the slopes of the mountain, there were houses with high roofs. This is Myskova, a small Polish border village. The scouts reported that neither the enemy nor the population was there. Neither men nor horses had the strength to move further. We made a halt. We hastily had a snack. The soldiers leaned against barns and houses and quickly fell asleep. But not all of them. I heard Senior Sergeant Onoprienko tossing on his overcoat, how he whispered with Efriat Provorov. Why are you awake? I asked quietly. I can't sleep, comrade captain. At least tired thoroughly, Onoprienko answered half-voiced. The first night behind enemy lines. Unknown all around, Provorov echoed softly. It's one thing when the Krauts are in front, and behind and on the sides are our own. But here it's quite different. I couldn't sleep either, despite the terrible fatigue. Obviously for the same reasons. Yes, danger is different, and affects the psyche in different ways. Sergeant Provorov was quite accurate about that. Behind enemy lines, all of us really felt uneasy. Well, midnighters, stop gossiping. That's right, loudly said Mysyakov, who, it turns out, also did not sleep a wink. I can't wait to get to the cavalrymen. It will be more fun with them. We fell asleep before dawn. But the anxious sleep of the exhausted miners was interrupted by a sudden shooting. Everyone jumped out from behind the houses and barns. A young Lieutenant N. Chatovskik, who had just arrived in the unit, collapsed on the ground before my eyes. We ran up. There was not a speck of blood anywhere. The lieutenant's death seemed mysterious. Lieutenant I. P. Fedoritz, recently appointed to us military paramedic, carefully examined the dead man and reported that he found a tiny splinter embedded in his temple. The enemy detected the battalion. The fire continued. It was necessary to hastily join the cavalrymen who had gone south. Who should be left to cover the withdrawal? I asked. Dubrovsky. Who else? Answered the commander without hesitation. Call him. Swarthy Captain R. V. Dubrovsky, very much like a gypsy. It was hard to believe that he was the son of a priest. This courageous, reserved man was known as a big silent. And I was quite surprised when one day, in a moment of frankness, he bitterly confessed. I think you, Chief of Staff, believe that Dubrovsky addicted to alcohol. That's unfair. Did I ever let the battalion down? Calm down, Alexei Vasilievich. Calm down, you poisonous root. You studied strategy at the academy, but I've been here since day one. I have to defend my native land and my mother teacher. I've done without diplomas and titles and I'll do without them, he suddenly finished resentfully. Dubrovsky was deservedly considered one of the most fallen and executive commanders. He was entrusted with the most important tasks. He was thoughtful, tried to deeply understand the situation and the task of the company, but painfully worried that he could not get a higher education. And when in April 1945, the captain was sent to study at the Higher Military Engineering School, he did not conceal that he regarded this fact as the highest award for himself. 
and awards, by the way the captain was not bypassed four battle orders were on his chest at the end of the war. But all this was later. And then, in the Carpathians, Dubrovsky only asked permission to perform and rushed to his company. The personnel of the battalion ran over to the pebbly valley of the Visloka River. The sun was already peeking out from behind the heights, and the rivulet was gradually turning orange. The firefight between Dubrovsky's company and the enemy had subsided. But we were sure that the company would not abandon the defence without covering our withdrawal to the end. The mountains, becoming higher and more formidable, clenched the narrow winding valley of the Wisloka River. Running past a hamlet, which seemed uninhabited, we saw a group of horsemen, obviously a scouting party. We became wary. But fortunately in vain. They were our own, a cavalry platoon was accompanying several carts with wounded. The enemy apparently slammed the throat of the breakthrough. In a low voice, so as not to hear the wounded, said the commander to the officer accompanying them. How can we be? All of them are not walking. Advising the officer to clarify the situation in the area of the neck of the breakthrough, we moved on with a heavy soul. We passed several small villages, nestled at the foot of the mountains, came to the highway and saw cavalry units positioned along it. So we had caught up with our own after all. The commander of the cavalry corps, Lieutenant General Viktor Kirillovich Baranov, a heavy, sedentary-looking man, with small, cheerful eyes, was sitting near a white hut in a small farm, located in a cleft next to the highway. The whole figure of the general reeked of tranquillity. He leisurely drank tea and spoke in a low voice with a taut colonel, the head of intelligence corps, P. N. Having listened carefully to the report of the combatant, the general said. Well, with sappers will not lose. Right, Pyotr Nikonovich. He turned to the colonel and, after a moment of silence, continued we know the situation at Mistov. There is more important news. A German tank division is approaching, and three more divisions, and you don't have enough mines. If only the sappers had more mines, we would not be afraid of tigers or other such predators. The corp entered the breakthrough light. The heavy equipment available in the troops, which could not be dragged along the mountain paths, was left on the big land. The 1st and 2nd Guards Cavalry Divisions, under the command of Colonel P. S. Fashurin and Major General Kaji Mamsurov broke through in a mounted formation, and the 7th Guards Cavalry Division of Colonel I. S. Borshiv had to dismount. The actions of the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps in the Carpathians are very poorly covered in the press. In the history of the Great Patriotic War, briefly said. On the night of September 13th, the cavalrymen broke through the fire screen created by the Nazis on the breakthrough site and went into the enemy rear. The fascist command threw considerable forces to cut off the Soviet units threatening the rear of its main grouping. Soon our cavalry were forced to fight in the encirclement in the mountainous and wooded area in the rear of the enemy between the settlements of Cremona and Polyony. And then a few more words about the fact that the Corps was fighting hard behind enemy lines. The sky was covered with clouds clinging to the rounded peaks of the Beskids. In the mornings and evenings fog descended on the area impenetrable curtain. Front aviation could not support its troops. In such conditions mine blast barrages were of special importance. Our battalion was under the direct command of the commander we with the combatant, and the reconnaissance platoon were located near the corps command. Toward evening I was called by the cheerful Colonel P. P. Popov acting as chief of staff of the corps. Come in, captain, in the hut. That's all our forest headquarters. How's the mood? Got a map. Look the neck of the breakthrough the Germans have intercepted. The 70th Infantry Division has been badly hurt there. And it's hard to help it now. We expect enemy tanks near Krempner in a few hours. Is that clear? It's urgent to cover this direction with mines. There are very few mines, comrade colonel. Only two wagons with mines have survived. Eh, hey, captain, captain, and you call yourselves engineers. Resourceful people. There are two ways out of every situation. You must understand, the 7th Division was left without ammunition, so we're looking for a way out to get weapons from the enemy. You try it too. The colonel looked at me expressively, squinting his light, deep-set eyes under his eyebrows. 
we decided to try to get mines and explosives from the enemy. The group of Lieutenant V. N. Moromtsev came to the advanced unit of the Nazis, defending the highway from the south. Thanks to the thick vegetation on the slopes of the mountains, our fighters crept unnoticed to the minefield. Poorly camouflaged mines were clearly visible on the highway. With the onset of darkness, we descended the slopes. Lightning flashed occasionally. Private I, Zaitsev and others, under the very nose of the enemy, boldly disarmed several anti-personnel jumping and anti-tank mines. The commander of the cavalry unit was reported that the mines were removed and the enemy did not react to the actions of our miners. The situation for a surprise attack was very tempting. Before dawn, cavalrymen on foot attacked Hitlerites from three sides. The attack was so unexpected that the enemy soldiers, without resistance, fled into the forest. Among the trophies were half a hundred anti-tank mines, standard charges in metal shells and various subversive means. The mine famine was briefly alleviated. In order to save money, the narrowest places were chosen for the installation of mines. They mined in groups of four to six mines. These groups were echeloned in depth. In several places were prepared mine barriers of German TMI, connected with each other cables. Trenches for miners' tank fighters, who were to drag mines under the tracks, were being equipped. The lack of mines had to be compensated by the installation of fuses made of trophy standard explosive charges. Soon the combatant, and I was called again by Colonel P. P. Popov. He was sitting on a fallen tree next to the head of the corps' intelligence, spreading a topographical map on his lap. Here, Pyotr Pavlovich, mines are needed, said Colonel P. N. Popov, making pencil marks on the map. The only reserve left two dozen anti-tank, reported Mysyakov. Don't be discouraged. Colonel Popov smiled encouragingly. Army General Sokolovsky calls me on the radio for a reason. As soon as the weather improves, airplanes will drop us ammunition, food, mines. And he was right. The next day, right from the morning, we heard the rumble of airplanes, and soon through the windows in the clouds parachute bags with anti-tank mines in them, besides breadcrumbs and canned food, rushed to the ground. It is true that several parachutes with mines were carried away by strong gusts of wind, and they hung far away in the trees, in places where the enemy was located. But still out of 200 dropped anti-tank mines, 109 were picked up by us, this made it possible to put up additional barriers. With the improvement of weather, our front aviation began to actively strike the German troops. It became possible to use and transport aircraft. In this connection, the battalion was given a task to quickly clear sites for receiving cargo parachutes and to equip a landing strip for U-2 airplanes. Manual labour we were able to facilitate thanks to the explosive work carried out with strict economy of every gram of TNT. Finally, the first airplane landed safely. Evacuation of wounded soldiers and officers began, which lasted for two days. Having finished the equipment of the tiny airfield, Drobnitsa and I began to clarify the locations of mines on the highway south of Krempner. When we started mining, there was no enemy in front of us. Suddenly, from behind a bend in the highway jumped out a one-horse cart. Don't shoot came from afar. When the wagon stopped, Two men approached us, one was a small man in peasant clothes, who turned out to be a partisan charioteer, and spoke Polish the other was a stocky, swarthy fellow in a jacket that was obviously too tight for him. Having looked at Drobnitsa and me, the swarthy one, worriedly, said, I am an attack pilot, senior Lieutenant Shacklin. My L2 was shot down over Zekopane. My gunner and I threw ourselves out of the burning airplane. The gunner was killed and I was picked up and cured by partisans. I feel fine now. I want to get to my unit. Help me. My only document is the Order of the Patriotic War. It is sewn in my jacket. You can make a request about me on the radio. They'll confirm it for you. The wish of Senior Lieutenant Shacklin came true, but only after the Corp units joined the front troops. At parting, he sincerely confessed. I used to look down on those who fight on the ground. I thought that even the victory is forged mainly in the sky. Only now, looking closer at everything, I realised how wrong I was. From above, it turns out you can see not everything. The situation was getting more and more heated. 
the enemy tried to take the corpse in the ring of encirclement and was preparing for a decisive assault. During the battles, the cavalrymen occupied the slopes of the mountains in the area of Kremtna, Polana, Siashenja, Zidovsky, cavalry units equipped firing positions. The guns were drawn to the heights, which from afar seemed completely inaccessible. It was hard work. And at the same time, from the direction of Kremtna came scraps of German radio transmissions in Russian. The German military command offered Russian cavalrymen to surrender in order not to be destroyed and to save their lives. Simultaneously, with such humane care for the lives and health of the Soviet guardsmen, the enemy intensified the search for reconnaissance groups. This made it more difficult to prepare for the explosion of the large transom and suspension bridge over the headwaters of the Wisloka River and the installation of mines on the detours. One day the squad of Sergeant N. Largin went out to mine along the forest path to the detour. It was already dark. Clouds densely covered the moon. The forest was quietly murmuring. The sergeant showed by signs that it was possible to start work. The mines were placed in the gravel of the not wide valley of the Visloka. Usually the river was shallow in this place. But after the rains its level had risen considerably. The noise of the forest and the rustling of the small pebbles overrode all other sounds. Largin noticed the silhouettes of enemy scouts approaching them when they were already on the pebbles. The sergeant gave a machine gun burst. Hitlerites responded. A firefight ensued. But in spite of everything mines, except for one, were still put on alert. Soon the command of the cavalry corps, Paul, made a decision on the night of September 18th to strike a sudden blow on the enemy in the direction of the village of Mistova, where the 70th Guards Rifle Division, which failed to get through to the cavalrymen, continued to fight hard in the encirclement. The units of Senior Lieutenant A. N. Ivanov and Captain N. S. Drobnitsa were tasked with ensuring the cavalrymen's passage through the mine barriers at Krempna. Some cavalry units passed through the passages. Others bypassed the enemy on mountainous forest trails on the flank. The attack turned out to be sudden. At Hitlerite's panic rose. And though it was not possible to break through to the village of Mistsova, the preparation of the enemy to storm the positions of cavalrymen and the 70th Infantry Division was disrupted. The gruelling battles began. German tanks in the Krempner area ran into a prepared system of our artillery fire and mine blast barriers. Having diffused the first rows of mines, Hitlerites fell on mines located in depth. The bridge was prepared for explosion by fire method because the sapper conductor necessary for the electric method of explosion was left on one of the carts repulsed by the Germans when the battalion crossed the front line. Because of the shortage of explosives, only the largest middle span of the transom suspension bridge was mined. The explosion was delayed. I had to find out from Alexei Ivanov why it happened. The tanks are at the bridge, and the sapper matches failed, stammering with excitement more than usual, he explained. You should keep the box closer to your body. The rains and sleeping on the ground made me damp. Well, how? I barely got a spark out of the lighter. Did all the charges work? It's all right, comrade captain. The tank flew into the exploded span. When they reported about the explosion of the bridge to the commander, Colonel P.N. Poe, who was present, calm, polite, and always carefully shaved, sighed and said in a low, chesty voice, this is not just a subversion. We have literally burned bridges behind us. There is no return. We must break through in a new direction. The fighting at Krempner turned into fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. We waited for the night, looking impatiently at the sky and at the clock. Dot, 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 on the night of September 20th, the corps, having regrouped, was covered by regiments of the 1st Division, and the forces of the 2nd and 7th Cavalry Divisions suddenly attacked the enemy in the direction of Polyana, Olhavitz, Tylieva. Even before daylight, Colonel Popov passed the order of the Corps commander. One company of miners to be subordinated to the commander of the 2nd Division, General Mamsurov, for action with his sapper squadron. Mamsurov's division will be the first to break the encirclement. In a ravine, overgrown with woods, we met two men. One was in a burqa up to his heels, the other in a greatcoat, holding two horses under the reins. 
the cavalryman in Burka turned out to be Major General Mamsurov. Having listened to the report, the general smiled in his thin black moustache and, looking at us cheerfully, asked, Why are you going this way? We were following the trail of horseshoes, comrade general, reported Dubrovsky. Well done, sappers. Usually only cavalrymen notice it. Hurry up time is short. The general easily jumped into the saddle. His figure merged with the horse, and his swarthy manly face shone with calmness and confidence. That's how he was remembered to me. Later I heard a lot about this amazing man, a hero of Spanish events and a brave scout. He understood several languages and spoke Spanish. Haji Mamsurov boldly acted in the rear of the Frankist rebels, and so entered the role that he was mistaken for a Spaniard. He had the opportunity to fulfil the most difficult tasks of the Republican command. After the war, Mamsurov worked in the general staff. But death does not bypass even the bravest. In 1968, hero of the Soviet Union Colonel General Kadji Umar Dizyorovich Mamsurov was buried in Novodovichy Cemetery. The fighting moved to narrow mountain passages and forest paths. Our cavalrymen managed to break away from the enemy for several hours. They advanced almost a dozen and a half kilometres to the Slovak insurgents. The war here was a special one. Attacks followed one after another. Everything was in dynamics. The nature of fighting imposed on the enemy had its own specificity during the day we fought stubborn defensive battles, and with the onset of darkness rapid blows broke through the ring of encirclement and went to a new area. It was repeated several times. Our food supply was bad, but horse meat helped us. The meat of killed horses was boiled and eaten immediately, because without salt it quickly spoiled. Juicy berries of blackberries, which we came across on the way in large quantities, supplemented the meagre ration. The problem of fodder for horses was also acute. One evening I. A. Onoprienko asked me for permission to go to the nearest farmstead. Kilometres, six kilometres, no more. Maybe we could get something for the wounded. A few hours later the senior sergeant returned with two large round breads and a jar of honey. Here, Slovak gave it to me. For the wounded. He's a good guy. Two houses in the woods. An apiary in a clearing. He says that during the day the Krauts come to him for honey, and at night hours for bread, told Onoprienko. As soon as the weather improved we were again dropped sacks with breadcrumbs, canned food, vitamins, but many parachutes with cargo were carried far away and we could not find them. The fighting in which we participated was getting closer by the hour to the Duklinsky Pass, memorable for Russian troops since the First World War. In the area of the village Olhavitz we came to a deep, but narrow mountain pass, stretching for several kilometres. Before evening we settled down in one of the small clefts branching off on the sides of the mountain pass. On the cliffs on the left and right thorny branches of spruce and fir trees covered the narrow cleft. We had to take a nap for at least two or three hours. We cut branches wet after the rains. They laid them on the ground. And on them overcoats. The story about grandmother about the soldier and about the soldier's overcoat, which is suitable for all occasions and as a mattress, as a sheet, as a blanket, and even as a pillow was repeated that evening. And although everyone knew this story by heart, they listened to it with pleasure, paying tribute to the kind and wise soldier's humour, which so helps people in a difficult moment. Two steps away from me, still chuckling, a cavalry major was wrapped up in his overcoat. Grunting and coughing, he tried unsuccessfully to cover his knees with his overcoat, and at the same time to hide his head under the overcoat. How damp it was, you can't get warm. But that's nothing, Captain. It was no easier for our compatriots here in the fifteenth year. And just here, nearby, in the Dukli area. I remember these events well. I listened to Porfiriev's lectures at the Academy. The Carpathian Operation, Brusilov's Eighth Army. Yes, yes, the Brusilovs interrupted the Major. Without winter uniforms, without transportation. Before the battle they changed into clean shirts in the cold. They even wrote songs about the Brusilovtsi. Have you heard them? It was wet snowing on Dukla then. A soldier on ice, 
a soldier on fire. And what, Captain, sighed my interlocutor, maybe they will write a song about us some day. The sun, having broken through the clouds with difficulty, caressed the people who were cold during the cold night. Birds were chirping, a woodpecker was tapping the trees. It seemed that the previous night attacks and rushes were just a dream. At the appointed time, as usual, we turned on the battalion radio station, and immediately we heard the familiar pleasant voice of the brigade radio operator. At once it became calmer, some invisible thread connected us with the big land. Our native battalion radio was faultless in operation. Having thrown the antenna on a tree standing at the crest of the hill, and having connected the hose with wires from the radio to the power supply, Senior Sergeant Onoprienko contacted the powerful brigade radio station. But it was not possible to start another session of radio communication the enemy broke into the mountain pass and attacked us from the neighbouring heights. Along the crevice where we were, bursting bullets flew. Exploding overhead, they made you feel as if you were being shot at point-blank range. A cavalry officer told us. These bullets give you a wound the size of a saucer. Several armoured personnel carriers, which had broken through from the direction of Olhovitz, moved down the passage, pouring lead on the cavalrymen lurking in the crevices. One of the sappers of the cavalry squadron jumped out of the shelled cleft and threw some mines under the tracks. At the same time, an artillery crew rolled a 40 patutka into the middle of the passage and shot two armoured personnel carriers at point-blank range. They stopped and went up in flames. And then the young lieutenant, who commanded the 40 kapiatka, looked around calmly and contentedly. Yes, he was the hero of the day. Hitlerites could not advance on the passage, cluttered with blazing cars. Cavalrymen and sappers breathed a sigh of relief and again impatiently waited for darkness to go deeper into the mountains. The commander of the cavalry regiment, a round-faced, broad-shouldered lieutenant colonel, who was in the same cleft with us, respectfully said, Though you are not cavalrymen, but you hold up well. We had not experienced such a thing as it was today, even in the Smolensk raid. Preparation for a decisive rush was not long. It was reduced to another regrouping of corps pure, units, it was decided to abandon part of the wagons. On the night of September 21st, the cavalrymen, having knocked down the German barrier, broke through to the difficult forests in the mountains of Slovakia. The cavalry corps corps crossed the Czechoslovakian border for the second time. On the escape routes and communications of the enemy in the areas of Visna, Pisana and Medvedzny, the battalion units set up obstacles. They were very modest two or three mines or one or two landmines from their own and trophy means. Sometimes single mines and surprises were set up. This made the German soldiers mindphobic and slowed their advance. Acting on the enemy's communications, the battalion's men disabled wire communication lines, cut telegraph poles, chopped wires and dragged them into dense bushes deep into the forest. In the course of the battles, we periodically managed to get small amounts of mines and explosives from the enemy. One day at dawn, the commander of the reconnaissance platoon A, N. Ivanov crept through the forest with several soldiers to the enemy location in the area of Nizhna Polyamka. The forest was shrouded in slumber. Battle guards of the Germans also dozed off under capes after a sleepless night. The rain was drizzling. Some bird was whistling. It was chilly. It took only minutes for Senior Sergeant A. G. Rysis and Colonel P. N. Provorov to cut the wire and remove some anti-personnel Stockmannen. The scouts crawled quite close to the mortar calculation. But the Hitlerites woke up from their slumber. From both sides, almost simultaneously shots rang out. None of ours was not hurt. Here managed to get briefly reported the commander of the reconnaissance platoon, putting on the wet grass four or five Stockmannen and three German artillery mines. Why do we need artillery mines? In vain risked, said the commander in his heart. No, comrade major, not in vain. Artillery mines will strengthen anti-personnel. We'll have a synchronised explosion. And mine artillery surprises were set. Even at the Kursk bulge we learned one of the front truths in war you can't repeat yourself. The more inventive our miners are, the more difficult it is for German miners. And it is not by chance that in the Journal of Battalion's Combat Operations it is stated that eleven groups of mines, installed then in the raid with cavalrymen, 
blew up five tanks and armoured personnel carriers and two enemy vehicles. Extremely necessary for us in those days was the support of aviation. But continuous rains completely paralysed its actions. And Hitlerites persistently attacked, did everything to prevent the connection of the Corps with the rebellious Slovaks. The situation was getting more and more complicated by the hour. The Second Guards Cavalry Division of General Mamsurov, with which the company of Captain Dubrovsky acted, occupied Dobroslava, but it was not possible to overcome the onslaught of parts of the 28th and 39th Infantry Divisions of the enemy and to reach the highway to Hunkov's Krajna Poljana. Companies of Captains Drobnika and Emianov provided the actions of the Corps units at Krajna Bistra. Miners were literally shaky from hunger and fatigue, but even in that difficult situation they were not abandoned by the sense of humanity, mental nobility. A hey, comrade captain, Lieutenant Moromtsev said to me bitterly, after an enemy shell exploded in the area where there was a large group of horses. A hey, comrade captain, he repeated quietly. I have heard more than once that people in war become rude. It's not true, believe me. And how wrong it is. Today, for example, I was at the terrible place where a Nazi shell exploded. How many horses were beaten there? And how many more wounded? I don't know, have you ever seen the eyes of a wounded horse? I did today. Such pain and longing in them that my heart still aches. The battles at Nizna and Krajna Palana, with the fresh German divisions coming up, required superhuman efforts from all of us. At one of the most tense moments in the gloomy sky suddenly appeared a gap between the clouds. And right away a crutch flashed over our heads. Leaflets flew to the ground. We saw General V... K. Baranov was given one of them. He squeamishly took a small leaflet and, frowning, brought it to his eyes. Here are bastards, said the combatant loudly, crumpling in his hands just read the leaflet. You were abandoned by the command. And you have to make up such a thing. In vain spoil the paper, calmly noted the head of the political department of the cavalry corps, Yuri Dmitrievich Miloslavsky, a thin colonel with a concentrated face. Our soldiers know the value of these papers, but it is not harmful to talk to them. The same day we gathered the officers of the battalion. Well, brothers sappers, asked the commander, soon to the big land. Hold on for two days only. That's right. Colonel Miloslavsky, by the way, asked to talk to the soldiers to explain that our tankers are breaking through. It's good that the tankers are breaking through, Captain Drobnitsa said judiciously. But we have to hold out for two days. There is something to think about. At such a moment you should reflect on your life. I, for instance, suddenly remembered my childhood. What a marvel. Yes, the situation was difficult, and the officers of the battalion understood it. Heavy fighting of cavalry formations, still trying to make their way to the south, to the Slovak rebels, continued. On the approaches to the Ondava River, the enemy attacked the Corps CP. We and one of the companies were close by. They're barking again. Onoprienko got worried. General Baranov gave an order. The horses were driven into the ravine. For ten to fifteen horses there was left one horseman. All officers of the Corps headquarters and us sappers led into the counterattack deputy commander of the Corps, Guards Major General K. R. Beloshnichenko. Hurrah. The fire stopped, Hitlerites fleeing between the trees flashed. But it was premature to rejoice. The cavalrymen ran out of ammunition, and the enemy continued to counterattack from the area of Nizhny Komarnik. The cavalry corps was ordered by the front commander to turn northward and move to join the 38th Army. Choosing the deepest paths, the cavalrymen began to make their way towards the advancing 4th Guards and 31st Tank Corps. To connect with the tankers, it was necessary to overcome an open clearing, which was shot from both sides of the flank fire. Part of the Sabelniki had already passed to their own through this wall of fire, when I was approached by the head of intelligence corps, Colonel PNP. N. Po. From the first days showed a touching concern for the battalion. Tell your men to hold on to the stirrups. It is easier to run, besides horses will protect from bullets. Bullets squealed. Tank cannons are head deafeningly. Hooves clattered. At times we heard hurrah. 
chasing horses we ran as fast as we could. And one thought was drilling in our brains hurry up to our own. At last the fire was somewhere behind us. We fell down on the cold wet ground without strength. And as soon as we came to our senses we were enclosed in strong male embrace of tankers. Our own. What a beautiful word it is. And how little we used to think about it. Dot, 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 dot. Immediately after joining the tankers the cavalry corps was withdrawn for rest and reforming and our battalion, or rather the part that remained of it, again subordinated to the commander of the 38th Army. The sappers were badly needed, and therefore they did not withdraw the battalion for reforming. After a short respite the soldiers were again engaged in mining not far from Svejov Polsk. Cold October rains were drizzling, wisps of fog clung to the heights. Aviation was doomed to inactivity, but the continuous fire raids of German mortars exhausted the soul. Sasha Chakashin, head of the battalion's engineering and artillery supply, with whom we joined after leaving the encirclement, sadly hummed to the guitar and again the Carpathians are frowning. Skillfully using the features of the relief, Hitlerites mined all passages and mountain paths, significantly reducing the distance between the mines. Mixed anti-tank and anti-personnel minefields were set everywhere, which should have made it very difficult to neutralise such areas. In one of the particularly rainy days, the combatant returned from the Shinja army. The downpour is such a terrible thing. And we need to urgently scout the area de Broslava. Order, Chief of Staff, he turned to me, let them call Ivanov. The commander of the reconnaissance platoon, the bravest and most modest senior lieutenant ANI, Ivanov did not take long to arrive. After reporting his arrival, he carefully hung out his wet cloak by a small stove and sat down to the table, looking questioningly at me and the commander. There is a matter, without preamble began Mysyakov. Look at the map. Do you see Dobroslava? There, in the mountain pass, we need to establish the presence of mines and determine their types. Got it? That's it. The weather's just right. You're just lucky. And I was born lucky, comrade major said Ivanov without a shadow of a smile. Such weather is really the best ally of a scout. Permission to carry out the task? No. No mines or landmines for you. If you fulfil the task, you'll get the third order. Alexey Ivanov, smiling, hastily put on a pilot's cap over his short black hair, threw a cape over his broad shoulders, then clearly, like a seasoned formation, saluted and headed for the exit. About seven hours passed. During this time, two trophy paraffin paraffin smoking pots had time to smolder. Early in the morning, the battalion duty officer ran into the headquarters dugout. Comrade Captain. Ivanov was brought. Jumping out of the dugout, we saw Senior Sergeant Rysis, who was carefully laying his commander on the ground with bandaged hands. It was getting light. The heavy rain, which had been falling all night, suddenly subsided. It seemed to us that Alexei moved. We bent over him whereas he wounded Rysis was silent, but his whole look was an expressive answer to our question. The commander came over, took off his cap and whispered, and yet he was born happy. Staff sergeant reported on the completion of the task. That same day we said goodbye to our battle friend forever, and a few hours later I had to sign a funeral for Alexei Ivanov before sending it to Smolensk, China. When I held this small piece of paper, it seemed that it burned my hands. The reconnaissance platoon formed by Ivanov reported directly to the battalion chief of staff, and I had the opportunity to get to know the senior lieutenant intimately. He was one of those people who are inevitably attracted by danger. Not only his subordinates spoke admiringly about Ivanov's iron calmness. I remember that south of Komsomolskoy, Ivanov's reconnaissance platoon three times participated in the search of the General Army reconnaissance of the 52nd Infantry Corps. When the thaw came in February, he and one of the dark nights together with A. Rysis, Junior Sergeant N. Turov and three more scouts made a passage in the mines, stealthily crossed the trenches of the Nazis and penetrated through the forest five kilometres deep into their defences. At dawn I met the senior lieutenant at the NP of the commander of the rifle battalion. I did not immediately recognise him Alexei Ivanov put on a cap and black rubberized cloak of the Hopman, whom the scouts had captured in the rear. Alexei Ivanov gave me his map, 
where there were marked enemy minefields, trenches, art positions and marked the location of some headquarters. How did you manage to find the headquarters? I asked not without surprise. The headquarters was found by wires. I brought you a Finnish knife as a souvenir, and there is nothing more to report. The senior lieutenant was stingy with words. I knew that and didn't ask any more questions, and I keep the Finnish knife with inlaid handle to this day as a memory of Alexei and the daring search of his platoon. But even without this souvenir I would not forget the senior lieutenant. All those who communicated with him still have notches on their hearts, and they make themselves known as long as a man lives. More than a month after leaving the encirclement, we had to clear the paths and roads along which the 38th Army continued to advance southward, both our troops and the Czechoslovak Corps persistently gnawing through the enemy's defence, advanced only a few hundred metres a day. These battles were a difficult test for us, but the battalion withstood it. Excruciatingly bending, the front line in the strip of the 38th Army crossed the Czechoslovak border. Our battalion crossed it for the third time, this time at the Duklinsky Pass. From the heights, the undulating line of the eastern Beskids was clearly visible, where not long ago we had been fighting surrounded. Now on the Duklinsky Pass there was a border post with the national emblem of Czechoslovakia. Next to it there was a post of Czechoslovak border guards from among the already shelled soldiers of the 1st Czechoslovak Army Corps. One of the most difficult operations ended with the capture of the Obshaska Valley and expulsion of the enemy over the Ondava River, and the day of the victory at Dukla October 6th is now celebrated as the birthday of the, of the Czechoslovak People's Army. And the Czechoslovak Ducal Commemorative Medal sent to me many years later reminds me of this day.